I'm now being referred a very broad range of mitral and tricuspid anatomy um, for patients who have severe regurgitant disease for consideration for percutaneous edge-to-edge -edge repair. Um, in the past, it, it was the case that we could treat A2 and P2 pathology and mostly degenerative. And that just isn't the case now. We can treat most mitral and tricuspid pathology now. Um, and that includes patients with commissural disease, patients with calcification, as long as there's a, an area without calcification, we can generally get around that. Patients with small atria, even patients with relatively small valves, you can treat with this technology. In the tricuspid position, relatively large coaptation gaps, patients with pacing leads, all of those cause challenges, but that, that doesn't mean that they're not treatable. One of the features of the Pascal device that makes me feel much more comfortable treating complex anatomy, particularly patients with pacing leads, particularly patients with lots of calcification, is that you can elongate it. So you're very, very unlikely to get stuck um, and it's a very, very uncomfortable position to be in, to be under the tricuspid valve, not able to deploy and not able to get the device out. And that just doesn't really happen with Pascal because you can elongate it. So it, it, you can get out of pretty much any situation. Because of that, I think we can take on a, a broad range of anatomy, but also I can take on anatomy that I know will be difficult, secure in the knowledge that if it is difficult and if it really is impossible, I will be able to get the device out. And I think that makes me feel much more confident about taking on difficult cases. For patients with secondary mitral regurgitation who have often have leaflet tethering, um, the leaflets are often under tension, um, the addition of the P10 device with the spacer means that we can take on that kind of anatomy. And because the spacer takes off a lot of the tension on the leaflets, you tend to get a more predictable result. You don't find yourself chasing the mitral regurgitant jet along the line of coaptation. You tend to, tend to just get a, a more predictable result and a, a more of a reduction in the mitral regurgitation. My practice is to, to, to drop the clasps and then reassess, make sure the clip hasn't rotated in a 3D on fast view, make sure that we've got enough tissue with the independent grasping. It's very easy to check that um, and it's very easy to optimize further if you need to. And what that means is you're just taking out the chance. You know, you're not, when you close the clip, you know that everything is is optimized that should be optimized. You know, you know that you've got leaflet going into, into the apex of the clasp. So um, I think it, having those kind of features removes some of the, the variability or the, uh, the, you know, the, the, the chance that comes when you finally release the clip in, in the end. So for the, these procedures need to be predictable. It can't, there can't be, um, variability in the results and, and to be able to use the device to grasp the leaflets, then optimize your grasp, then confirm your orientation and to check all of those things. My practice is always to check the pulmonary veins before and after every grasp to make absolutely sure I've got the result I think I've got. And the predictability of this device is that if you do all of those things, when you then release the device, there are no surprises. It tends not to, it, you know, that nothing much changes. If anything, Quite often, with release, the mitral regurgitation gets a bit of uh, the residual mitral regurgitation gets a bit better, but it, it, there are generally no surprises at that moment, which I think is really important when we're trying to strive for those kind of results. Mm -hmm.